Hi everyone, this is Dr. Polito, and what I'm going to do right now is give you a short version of chapter 11. What I'm basically going to do is explain to you what you need to focus on in your studying independently. Okay, so here we go. The first thing that you have to know is the coverings of the heart. So understand the pericardium, understand the, uh, the pleura, okay, so the parietal pleura, understand the, uh, the blood flow of the heart. So you're going to see the vena cava here the inferior and superior aspects of it. Um, okay, so basically this slide uh, explains an overview of the heart and, and where it's positioned in the thoracic cavity, okay? You know, the diaphragm, etc. Okay, the pulmonary trunk, you can understand that as the counterpart to the aorta in some ways, right? So the, the pulmonary trunk is what flows the blood into the lungs, so that's part of the pulmonary system. All right, understand the mediastinum. The mediastinum is that central component within the thoracic cavity. All right, so um, you don't have to worry too much about exactly where it's positioned with the second rib, um, although it is nice to know the uh, point of maximal intensity. This is where we put our stethoscope, right? Okay, so this is just the bird's eye view of the top, right? So if we take the cross section across here and we look down, now we're here. So there's the heart, here are the lungs, right? Here's your backbone. And so you can see here's the mediastinum there. Okay, um, we talked about this in class. If you take the heart itself, and imagine, uh, or rather, if you remember the analogy of the, the water balloon, right? Take a water balloon and we put our fist through it, right? Um, we go that way, then what happens is you get this kind of situation, right? And your fist is on the inside. So this is what the heart is surrounded by. This is the, uh, the coverings of the heart. And here's the key, the inside right here, the inside of the balloon, so to speak, is equivalent to the outside of the heart wall. Okay, so they're connected. So the heart wall, you can see this right here is the heart. Okay, and this right here is the coverings. They share that common boundary. Okay, the visceral layer of the serous pericardium. Okay, so the, so the visceral layer of the serous pericardium is equivalent to the epicardium. All right, so you can refer to it either way. So overall, the balloon portion of it all is called the pericardium. All right, so understand the different parts of it around here understand the myocardium and the endocardium as well understand that these are very thin membranes right and then this is the inner heart chamber so this would be in this case which one would this be would that be a ventricle or an atrium okay that would be good an atrium and is that the left or the right one okay that's the left one okay understand everything on this diagram it's a little overwhelming at first blush but as we go through this um, or as we went through this in class rather everything kind of made sense right so if one way to do it the way i like to think about it is you just start at the beginning of the story where the blood's flowing in from the uh in from the body through the vena calvas right they start here it goes down to the atrium i'm sorry into the ventricle right it fills up passively and then a bump pumps and this shuts and this shuts until the pressure builds up so much it explodes out this way so this is the pulmonary system right and then the blood flows back from the lungs okay and it fills up the left atrium which also builds up pressure builds up pressure until boom it goes down into the left ventricle which builds up pressure builds up pressure and then boom into the aorta and everywhere else okay understand the differences between the left and right ventricles understand why so why is the left ventricle so thick when it comes to the musculature compared to the right ventricle okay pause the video and think about that okay if you answered because the left ventricle has to pump everything far away you would be correct the right ventricle's only job is to pump it into the nearby lungs so it doesn't have to be as strong okay and also understand the septum the septum is this uh this tissue this thick tissue that basically, or not thick tissue, it's just tissue, not, it's pretty thin actually, that divides the, um, uh, it divides the chambers of the heart, right? So down here, it's, it's all a continuous thing, right? That's the key here. Even though the book talks, I mean, read about it, you talk about the, the distinctions here. The, the intraventricular septum, for example, is just this part, but understand it's all continuous, right? So the septum basically divides either the ventricles or divides the atria. Okay, understand the two different tracks of uh, pumping. So we have the systemic track and the pulmonary track. We are, or you can call it pulmonary circulation and systemic circulation, right? If you remember what the word systemic means, systemic means uh, overall, system-wide, right? You have a systemic blood infection. That means your blood's affected everywhere, 
right? So systemic, uh, a systemic change in a system is a, is a change that affects the entire system. So systemic circulation is basically covering the entire body, okay? And then pulmonary, when you see that word pulmonary, you think breathing, you think lungs, right? And so we have the pulmonary circuit and we have the systemic circuit. So understand how that all works. Okay, what I presented for you here, and you can go through these one at a time, is the steps by which the heart valves open and close. Okay, and it's written in a slightly confusing way, so please refer to my study guide. The study guide, I have this, uh, I rewrote it a bit and make it uh, a little bit simpler to understand. Okay, and I have no idea how I just zoomed in. There we go. Okay, so this here, this is the operation of the uh, atrioventricle uh, valves, where, uh, so that's the, what, remember, let's, let's name the valves really quick. Okay, so what's this one? All right, if you remember, well, maybe one reminder, one trigger here is there's three heart strings here, the chordae, the, the chordae tendinase, and those are the, um, so there's, this is the tricuspid valve, right? And then this one has two, so this is the bicuspid, also known as the mitral valve, okay? So those are the two AV valves, or atrioventricular valves. Those are the valves that separate the atria and the ventricles. Okay. In contrast, we have the semilunar, uh, semilunar valves. Those are the ones that basically stop the uh, start or stop the blood from flowing out from the heart. Right. And so there's, there's the, the two basic ideas, right? There's the aorta and then there's the pulmonary trunk. So there's the pulmonary uh, uh, valve and then there's the aortic valve, right? So those are the two. And you can read about this too. Again, look at the study guide. Okay, so on the outside of the heart now, you have to understand the heart itself is serviced by blood from the heart and it doesn't get any special treatment inside. So the blood has to flow out of the heart and then it'll flow over the heart, right? And so I've eliminated any of the vocabulary or the uh, identifying, uh, identification markers on things that I don't need you to know. So know everything on this slide. Um, and the key here, right, the, the most important arguably would be the right coronary artery and the left coronary arteries. Those are the arteries that service the muscles of the heart, right? So when people say they have a coronary, that's because these are the ones that get blocked, okay? Now which leads to a heart attack, okay? Otherwise, everything here you've already kind of seen before, there's your, the vena cava, there's the inferior and superior aspects of it. Um, you can see the, uh, the right pulmonary artery and the left pulmonary artery, which come out of the pulmonary trunk, right? So this right here, this is where you get the, um, here, let's do this. That's the pulmonary circuit, right? So it goes from here in the right atrium down to the right ventricle and then through the trunk into the lungs and then they collect to the left atrium again, okay? So just keep telling yourself the story of how the, everything flows and it'll all start to make sense. Give a, a purpose to each of these things for yourself, right? Like the aortic arch, why is it arching? Well, you gotta go back down, you gotta service the rest of the body, right? Uh, the carotid artery, here's another important one, right? The carotid arteries service the, the top of the head. By the way, here's a fun fact. When you look at the etymology of the word carotid, carotid comes from a Greek word meaning um, being dumbfounded or, or stupefied. And the idea here is, is if you put pressure on these, it causes people to you know, not become confused because you're losing blood supply to the brain. So that's where that word comes from. Isn't that interesting? Okay, so up to this point, we've talked about the gross anatomy and the basic blood flow of the heart. Now we're gonna talk about how the heart pumps, the circuitry of it. And this, I've tried to simplify this as best as I can. Um, for a complete version of this, you can look at this slide. But again, this is way more than you need to know for the test or for our purposes. But if you're somebody that wants to dig into this a bit, feel free to look at this a little bit or a little bit more detail. Okay, I want you to know the SA node, right? So the sinoatrial node, the atrioventricular node. The, so, so there's the SA and then there's the AV, okay? You don't have to worry about Bachman's bundle. Basically, Bachman's bundle services the other atria, or the, uh, the, the left atria, okay? So when this thing fires, bzz, okay, the other atria fires very quickly, right? And again, it's quick because there's nothing in its way. So this is, that's what Bachman's bundle is, okay? Um, because there's this SA node, when this fires and it hits here, this bundle in turn fires down that way, this causes that very short 0.1 second delay, which allows these to contract, followed by these to contract, right? So it's, that's why it's that bump, bum, right? It's because of this situation here. This, this delays it a little bit. So that's the purpose of the AV node, okay? You don't really have to know the Hiss bundle here. And it's, by the way, it's pronounced Hiss. Um, actually, no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I take that back. You do need to know the, the bundle of Hiss. Okay, so you need to know the SA, the AV, 
the Hiss bundle. And then these cool guys, the Prokinji fibers. Prokinji fibers are just the uh, nerves that service the outside, the, the anterior portion of the ventricles, which allow it to beat. Okay, so that's the basic idea here. So if you go back a slide now, you can see here, here's the SA node, okay? And you can see this is, I, I like how your book just kind of glosses over the, uh, the Bachman's bundle. It just, oh yeah, this gets zapped too, okay. And then, um, the, so again, these arrows, what do these arrows represent to you? Think about that, pause it and think about it. What do these, what do these arrows represent? Okay, these are the neural firings, right? The X, uh, the X, oh boy, the action potentials. Right, the action potential is on the SA node. Good. Okay, so we have the action potential fires here. Okay, this causes the right atrium to pump. Okay, pushing the blood down that way, and then oh, and and then of course very quickly this also pumps. Okay, so this is pushing blood down in this way. This is pushing blood down in that way, and then as this fills up, as this gets pushed, the pressure here closes this valve. Right. This valve's currently closed, and so this builds up in pressure a bit, and then finally, boom, it pumps out that way, okay? Why does it have that delay? Why does this delay? Again, because the action potentials come down here to the AV node, and then from the AV node, down that bundle of Hiss, into the Purkinje fibers. That slight delay is what allows this set of, uh, the, uh, this set to fire, so the atria to fire, just before the ventricles fire. Okay, but so understand that even though we tell the story of the blood going here, then here, then out, then back, then here, then here, even though that's the zigzag of the blood, understand that these are pumping, the atria are pumping at the same time. So everything's happening simultaneously. Okay, the blood's coming in from the lungs and then out through the aorta at the same time as the blood's coming in from the body, down into the ventricle, and then over into the pulmonary system. Okay, um, I posted a link to a blood flow video on YouTube. Feel free to watch that if this is still confusing to you. Okay, so here's basically, here are the steps. Again, I diagram these in the study guide, so feel free to go through these one at a time um, and read it carefully and understand it. One of the points of confusion potentially would be what's called the isometric relaxation. Okay, isometric relaxation, or basically the concept, I'm sorry, isovolumetric relaxation or isovolumetric contraction. The key here is that when we talk about isovolumetric, meaning same volume, really what this is, is this area here, okay, the two ventricles, they are building up in pressure, okay, and both the valve systems are off. Okay, so the analogy that you can think of is take a saran, uh, take a glad uh, plastic bag, okay, and fill it with water, All right? So, so think of a think of a one of the Ziploc bags. Oh boy, these are terrible drawings. Hold on, let me try this again. So, think of a sandwich bag, right? And you know you have the the Ziplocs right here. So, fill it with water, okay? And do this at home if you want. Fill it with water and then seal it. And then slowly squeeze, apply pressure here, and eventually the, the bag will, you know, just be taut and rigid. But then eventually what's going to happen? This is going to burst, right? And so that's the idea. Isovolumetric contraction is when you're pushing this thing as hard as it can, but it's not bursting yet. And then, boom, it bursts, okay? That's how you get to the ventricular or uh, the ejection phase or systole of the ventricles, okay? All right. You don't have to know all the, uh, the crazy complex details here when it comes to regulating how the heart beats, but understand that the sympathetic nervous system um, can regulate it. Okay. Understand that there are some hormones that regulate it as well. I also understand that parasympathetic nervous system will also slow it down, right? So basically, when you look at this diagram, understand that, you know, red means slow and green means go. So you can look over here if you want, but really, I don't care about the various details here. Just understand the concepts that the heart has its own beat going on from the SA node, right? But then in addition to this constant rate, which is about 70 to 75 beats in a healthy individual, we can change that 75 beats per minute based on various stimuli, whether it's from the nervous system or whether it's from the endocrine system, okay? So there we go. Or, or something physical like exercise or you just have something physical going on, all right? Okay. 
All right, now, so that's the heart. Now let's talk about, because we're doing the cardiovascular system, we have to deal with blood vessels too. So we have arteries and veins, okay? And arterioles and venules and capillaries and all that. So let's just very quickly go over that. So the difference here, and I really like this slide because it shows you just, you know, say it with, uh, say, uh, show it, don't say it, right? As they say in the movies. So arteries are thick. You can see that this artery is very well lined or thick uh, muscular musculature. And you can see that the vein is not very thick. Right. So, and the other thing is, is notice that the artery is, doesn't have a lot, uh, the interior, uh, part, uh, the, uh, the, the lumen is much more narrow in the artery than in the vein. Okay. So, so basically know the gross anatomy of arteries and veins. You don't have to know the super details, right? So I, I eliminated some of the, uh, the words in here. I don't want you to expect, but understand. So obviously know the lumen, that's the, the interior portion. Okay. And then well, the way I would study it is start on the inside and, and head out to understand it. So the very, very inside, these cells here, these are basically skin cells, but instead of calling them epithelium, we call them endothelium to signify that they're inside. Okay. And then remember, go back to your tissue knowledge. All tissues have to have some kind of base membrane, right? So we have some kind of membrane that's shrouding this. And then following that, we have some loose connective tissue. Okay. And you don't have to worry about the Swiss cheese components. That's basically the matrix that that's a basement membranes. Okay. And then we have most importantly with the arteries, we have the tunica media. This is smooth muscle, right? So this is uh, the way that we contract the blood as we move through the body away from the heart, where it's harder and harder to influence the external areas of the heart, the systemic system, because the heart's so far away, the muscles take over for the pumping. Okay. And now on the very outside, we basically have a thick, nice uh, uh, fibrous layer, the, the tunica externica, which is just collagen, right? Which we've seen everywhere. Okay, so that's the artery. The vein's the same basic concept, except notice that the lumen's bigger, right? So if you compare this to this, right? The most other important difference though, the biggest difference is the valves, right? These valves here, like the heart valves, prevent backflow. So when arteries, are contracting, the blood is always moving in one direction, which is essential, right? Eventually we have to find its way back to the heart. Okay, so that's the arteries and the veins. Now, so when I say artery or I say vein, or you read these words, understand these are the big major highways of the blood, okay? The arterioles or the venules, these are now mini ones. These are smaller tributaries. Think of these as the exit off the main highway. The arterioles and the venules lead eventually to what we call the capillary bed. Okay, so a capillary, these things are teeny tiny, right? So the, like, for example, the distance here is like five microns or something crazy like that. 0.5 microns, it's tiny, okay? And the key difference here is notice that capillaries don't have all the tunics, right? They lack all that. All they have is a basement membrane and some cells, the endothelial cells, okay? And the reason this is so thin, it's to allow exchange of things like oxygen, carbon dioxide, nutrients, and waste. That's the basics here, okay? And so on the artery side of the capillary bed, as we pump, remember this is thick and pumping, right, from the heart. So the pressure of the blood is going to be greater than the tissue's osmotic pressure. So that's gonna cause fluid to leak out. And that's how we deliver oxygen everywhere and nutrients, okay? On the venous side of the capillary bed, where the pressure inside the venule is much lower than the outside, now you can see why this is so wide. That reduces the pressure. That's gonna cause everything to flow into the, vein, the veins, right? So we're gonna have the osmotic pressure of the fluid. Think of things like uh, albumin are in there. They're gonna cause the pressure to, the, the osmotic pressure is gonna push everything into the veins. Okay, so that's the basics there. Okay, so you can see here just the way uh, directionality is enforced in the system. In the vein, you can see that there are these one-way valves, right? So you see how this is closed? That means blood can't go back that way. Blood can only go this way, okay? That's the basic idea there. Okay, one little thing, one little minor detail is th there's one way to control the direction of blood into capillaries. Let's say you, you don't wanna waste a bunch of energy by um, saturating tissue with a whole bunch of blood. Like let's say a muscle at rest. Okay, this is really cool. We're gonna take this capillary bed. I want you to visualize there's two main uh, paths that blood can take. This main path here, just like think of, think of it as the shortcut, right? That's called the shunt, the vascular shunt. 
notice that the capillaries are all wrapped by smooth muscle. So imagine if we constricted this. Well, let's say, okay, so we're not constricted. So that means the blood can just flow everywhere, right? And so it spreads throughout the tissue and everything's great. But what happens if we constrict these muscles? Now you don't have the blood flowing anywhere except directly through the shunt, okay? So this is a way that we can regulate um, and uh, basically uh, increase the efficiency of the body by only servicing areas of need, okay? All right, you do not need to know the names of all these. I'm just providing this to you for those of you who are going to move on with anatomy and physiology and you wanna get a sense of the complexity here and maybe you have some questions in, yourself, uh, in your mind about this. But uh, the only ones that I want you to know are from the other slides, right? So there's the carotid arteries. Notice there's a couple of them. And again, that's because you push up against this and you reduce the amount of blood going to your brain. And so you get uh, stupefied. And that's what that word comes from, okay? The, uh, the brachial arteries, the other big one, because this is where we do blood pressure, right? Which I'll explain very briefly in a second. Otherwise, don't worry about the rest of the stuff. Um, same with the veins. Um, so jugular, the jugular, jugular is a, comes from a Greek word meaning, I think like saddle or something that goes, or not saddle, um, what you put around horses or oxes, the yoke, the yoke. So the idea here is that it's, a, it's, it's up around here. So that's what the word, when we say go for the jugular, that's what, uh, that's where that word comes from. It's, it's not very exciting at all. Otherwise, your book goes into um, a whole area on the hepatic portal system. I don't need you to know that for the purposes of our, our um, tests. Again, keeping things basic. But the, the hepatic portal system is basically the way that the body um, uh, uh, filters things through the liver to detoxify things. So for example, so here's the basic idea. Once your food and whatnot gets into your stomach, okay, the veins in your stomach and the surrounding area end up, some of it, not all of it, end up pushing the blood up into the liver to get serviced. And then once things are in the liver, the liver detoxifies them, it, um, it captures them, whatever, and then we can eventually process it for excretion, right? But in the meantime, some of that blood then eventually finds its way back up to the vena cava, and then it goes up to the heart, okay? So the various drugs that we take sometimes have to bypass the hepatic portal system. So for example, if you wanna take a drug and it gets destroyed by the liver, we have to avoid this. So that's when you would take something like underneath your tongue, for example, okay? In contrast, other drugs, we actually have to take orally because they go through the hepatic system, the uh, hepatic portal system, and they get processed and activated by the liver, okay? So that's a little fun fact there. You don't need to know that for the tests. So feel free to skip the rest of this or feel free to, um, don't don't study that stuff <laughs> okay and then another little fyi this again you know, it's not gonna be on the test but this is uh well i shouldn't say that the only thing i'm gonna expect you to know is what's called the circle of willis the circle of willis is basically how the brain's uh blood is provided right so this is the circuit that provides uh blood flow to the brain you don't need to know the names of the various carotid arteries and the cerebral arteries and all that just understand what the circle of willis is it's the way that the brain gets serviced from the cardiovascular system okay and so here's just a profile view of it or i should say a, a medial section okay blood pressure here's where we go okay so systolic so remember systole and diastole right the key here, the key here is, is that the systolic pressure, which is the highest pressure, right? Okay, so step back and look at the data for a minute. Okay, we're dealing with, um, so, so as we go further this way, this is, think of it as distance from the heart, okay? Distance from heart, okay? And so we start the aorta and we can imagine because we're so close to the heart, pressure so this side's pressure the y-axis here is pressure and measured in milligrams of mercury basically how much pressure we need to rise one millimeter of something very heavy mercury uh one centimeter or one or rather one millimeter that's that's what we're talking about here that's what that means okay so you can see all the way at the peak top here 120 what that means is as the blood leaves the aorta and we measure the amount of pressure that is okay that's 120 millimeters of mercury that can be pushed upwards in response to that pressure, okay? So because the systolic pressure is the higher pressure, <clears throat> because remember, systole is the contraction. That's when everything, that, that things are at its peak, okay? That's what, <clears throat> excuse me, that's what systolic pressure is. As we move away from the heart, that pressure goes down very dramatically, right? And so where we measure the heart, 
obviously, I'm sorry, the, the blood pressure, where we measure it in the brachial artery, right, when we wrap the arm, right, and we have the device here, this pressure here is a little lower, right? It's somewhere around here, okay? And so if you see that, we're at about oh, maybe, maybe here, okay? But around somewhere in this region here, that's where your upper arm is. And so when we measure blood pressure, this is how it basically works. This thing gets pumped up so much that the pressure is greater than the pressure, the systolic pressure coming down, right? And then uh, when the healthcare practitioner slowly releases the pressure, they're listening. They're basically listening. So they have the stethoscope right here. They're listening for the first boom, for the first little sound to be made, which means that whatever the, uh, the pressure is as they release it, the moment they hear the sound, they look and see how much pressure that is, right? Because that's the pressure that's uh, going to be when the heart can now st is strong enough to push through the pressure in the sleeve. And so that's what we mean by a 120. Okay. For example, if your heart, uh, if your blood pressure is uh, the systolic is 120, that's that first sound they listen for. Okay. And then as they continue relaxing this, the sound gets louder and louder and louder as more and more blood's flowing through until finally the blood goes, the, the sound goes away. And at that moment, that sound going away, that's what they measure the diastolic pressure, okay? When the relaxation pressure, okay? And so that's why we say, that's why we give blood pressure as a high number and a low number, right? So we say 120 over 70 or whatever. Okay, so that's blood pressure in a nutshell. Okay, um, again, just like the heart rate, you don't need to know the details here of what regulate blood pressure. Although because blood pressure is such an important aspect of our everyday life, especially as we age, and because cardiovascular disease is the number one killer in America still, it behooves you to understand this stuff a bit, okay? And so uh, even though I'm not gonna assess you in any great detail on the test, feel free to read through this and understand it a bit, okay? So the key take homes here Okay, the key difference here is, is that we can constrict the vessel, right? So imagine pinching a garden hose, that's gonna cause an increase in pressure or resistance, that's gonna increase, uh, increase the pressure. The other thing you can do though is increase the amount of volume, right? So you can imagine if you have a lot of salt in your body, you're gonna bring in a lot of water and that's gonna increase the overall output of the, uh, the heart every time it pumps, that's gonna increase the pressure, okay? So let and then in addition, we can also just increase the rate at which the heart's pumping, which is gonna also increase the rate at which uh, the, the heart's uh, outputting blood. And so that'll increase blood pressure, okay? All right, the last thing here, again, you don't need to know the details of any of this. Here's the take home, the take home. So this is how things are exchanged between the tissue and the blood, okay? So if I make a simplified version of this diagram here, okay, so here's the square, Okay, here's the capillary. Okay, and remember capillaries have a basement membrane and then they have cells. Okay, so the basic idea here is, is things are being exchanged. Okay, what's being exchanged? Well, from the blood, we're going to have oxygen leave and go into the tissue. Okay, the tissue is gonna have carbon dioxide going back in because that's part of the waste products. In addition, we're gonna have nutrients leave the blood to go into the tissue, things like glucose, right? And then there's gonna be various waste products, things like uric acid or um, bilirubin or just stuff that goes into the blood, okay? So that's the very simple idea. So the, the most important part here is that it's related to concentration gradients, okay? Because there's more oxygen in the blood than there is in the tissue, oxygen's going to diffuse down its concentration gradient. This goes all the way back to one of our early chapters. And because there's more carbon dioxide building up inside, it's gonna diffuse into the blood. Okay, so everything's basically flowing down their concentration gradient. Okay, they're diffusing, that's the key here. Okay. All right, so now I already explained this earlier when we did the uh, capillary beds, but let's say this again. So as the heart pumps blood, right? So there's a lot of pressure here. That pressure is gonna be greater than the osmotic pressure in the interstitial fluid. So if this is the interstitial fluid, there's stuff in there. And if you remember osmosis, water flows from hypertonic to hypotonic, right? So if there was no pressure at all, the heart just stopped and this was all relaxed, right? Then because there's so much stuff, I'm sorry, because there's way more stuff inside the blood, water's gonna tend to flow 
in, right? But if we push really hard from the heart, we're going to push water out and nutrients and oxygen into the interstitial fluid. So that's what we're doing here. We're pushing, we're physically pushing, okay? In contrast, as we get further along past the capillary bed, we now have osmotic pressure in the interstitial fluid which is much greater than the now reduced blood pressure. Again, remember that ve veins are also very broad compared to arteries. And so as a result, we're gonna have a net influx of water going into the venule, okay? And in addition to um, so carbon dioxide, we're also gonna have waste products going in, right? And then that's gonna go and service back to the heart or the hepatic portal system or whatever. And down here, this is basically just a chart showing that as we move away from the heart, blood pressure goes down, okay? And you can see there's this key threshold right here. That's that point at which blood will stop pushing and start pulling, okay? But then you still okay, so that's, 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 so that's that's it. That's all we're gonna cover for the test, right? So, um, so study, 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 email me study questions, and good luck.